are so pleased to have Dr. Lisa Carey with us today. She is a distinguished professor for breast cancer research in the Division of Oncology and also Deputy Director of Clinical Sciences for Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center at UNC Chapel Hill. Her research interests focus on examining the different subtypes of breast cancer, evaluating new chemotherapy agents in early breast cancer, and predicting response to therapy. Dr. Carey was recently ranked as one of the top 10 breast cancer experts in the United States and is known worldwide for her research on triple negative breast cancer. Dr. Carey, it is truly an honor to have you with us today. Thank you, Liz, that was really kind of you. Um, so uh, I will just take it away and then and then we'll have a chance to right, so um, let's talk to a little talk, bit about triple negative, negative breast cancer. After, you know, um, I, run, run uh, this, so. I actually have some disclosures that none of them are personal disclosures. They are research funding to my institution. Um, so I think we have to start with the basics and and and, you know, the basics are like what exactly when we talk about breast cancer. What do we mean now? We mean the malignant growth or a tumor that's resulting from the division of abnormal cells from the breast. And the part about being from the breast is, is key because because part of this, we're gonna talk about metastatic cancer. And so it's either in the breast or from the breast because if it goes in the liver later, it's still breast cancer. So it's breast cancer if it arose from cells that comprise the breast, right? Normal breast parenchymal tissue. If it's a lymphoma in the breast, it's not breast cancer, it's lymphoma. Um, it can divide and grow without normal control, right? The usual regulatory apparatus that controls growth of your cells in your body has gone haywire, and that's what makes it a cancer. And part of that is its ability to invade other tissues is what makes it a malignant tumor as opposed to a benign tumor. So there are benign tumors that just grow and get bigger, but they can't invade. So, and the, the point I make, because this is a frequent, I think, uh, area of confusion, it doesn't matter if the tumor is in the breast, lung, or liver. If it came from the breast, it is breast cancer. Um, and if it goes to any other site besides the breast and the lymph nodes that are draining the breast, so those local lymph nodes, beyond that is called distant metastases. The area in the breast and the local lymph nodes is not distant metastases. So we're gonna talk today just about triple negative. If you just say, how, what proportion is triple negative in general, it's about 15 to 20% of what we call incident cases, which means new, like if you were just taking from, you know, in the year of 2021, all the cases diagnosed in 2021, about 15 to 20% would be triple negative. So what are the characteristics of it? You know, I mean, there are some characteristics that, that don't necessarily differentiate it, but can, you know, help to characterize it. One is it is one of the more rapidly growing subtypes of breast cancer. It's what we call higher grade. So grade is a, a characteristic based on the, how the cancer looks under the microscope. And if it looks more like normal breast, then it's lower grade. If it looks more uh, like it's uh, proliferating quickly and more abnormal, then it gets to be a higher grade. And there's a biomarker that's key, called key 67 that some of you may have uh, encountered in, in pathology reports. It's a common biomarker. I don't think it's particularly useful uh, in general. We don't, we don't actually do it at UNC because it hasn't been found to be independent of some of the other things that uh, uh, we do. Um, and in triple negative, it really isn't particularly helpful because it's almost always high. And of course, the reason it's called triple negative is because it's negative for the three targetable proteins in breast cancer, the estrogen receptor or ER, the progesterone receptor or PR, and HER2, which is an unrelated protein that causes a more aggressive uh, type of cancer. And if it's negative for all of those, we call it triple negative, um, which, as you can tell, that means it's defined by what it isn't, which is not very helpful as we're trying to think about, you know, precision medicine and trying to identify targetable um, abnormalities in a cancer. And so this is a, a challenge for the future. So 95% of triple negative breast cancers are what we call early, which means they are stage one, two, or three at diagnosis. That means it's, they're limited to the breast or the breast and the local lymph nodes. 5% are actually metastatic at the, at the point that they're diagnosed. That means they are stage four at the time that they're diagnosed. Now, 
in addition to that 5%, there's another 20% of the, of the 95 at the top that relapse at some point and become metastatic. So that 5% are metastatic from the very beginning to distant sites. And then you add another uh, uh, 20% or so relapse at some point, and that's metastatic disease. And of course, much of what we try to do is to try and keep the 95% of people from ever relapsing. So, you know, getting back to, to the fundamentals again, which is, you know, how are we trying to better understand breast cancer and in particular triple negative breast cancer and that a lot of that is coming through through genetics. I'm not going to get into huge details about this because at the moment, a lot of this is promissory notes, but there is some real evolution of our understanding from a genetic standpoint of what makes up triple negative breast cancer, which may give us uh, therapeutic opportunities in the future even more than now. So remember when we, if I do lapse into biology speak and I'll apologize in, in advance, I think I, I think I took out biology speak from the talk. <laughs> I tried to anyway, but, but remember when we talk about the sort of continuum of ways in which we're studying triple negative breast cancer, it really is a continuum. And, and that's because, you know, you're, everybody's familiar with genes, you know, and genes are the blueprints of the cell, right? They are what in fact tells the cell what to make. And so that's the blueprint. From the blueprint comes RNA. RNA is this intermediate step. And from RNA, that becomes proteins. And the proteins are what actually are making up the cell. So they're the building, the, uh, the actual uh, formation of the cells made up of proteins. And cancers have aberrations all along that continuum of genes, RNA, and proteins. Now, if we just talk about genetics, because what we know best is the genetics, the gene part, which is the DNA part, um, but there's two different kinds. And so, so again, this is more framework, but when I, we talk about genetics as it relates to cancer, there's two kinds. One is the genetics of the tumor and the can, an invasive cancer always has abnormal genet genetics. That's a, that's, a, that's a hallmark of cancer. That's one of the things that makes it cancer. It's always deranged. And that's in fact, some of our targetable drugs come from the genetics of the tumor and aberrations that are unique to the tumor. So you can have drugs that target that aberration because you know that it's only in the cancer. It's not in the rest of the body. If it was in all the rest of the body, you can't target it because you would be treating all the cells and you'd be killing all the cells in the body. So it has to be you know, an aberration that's unique to the tumor. Those are called somatic changes. But there's also the genetics of the person. That's the things that you inherit from your mother or your father. Um, that can affect your risk of cancer. I'll talk about that in a minute. And it can also affect how cancer drugs work, how well they work, and the side effects they have. Um, and certain drugs, and I'll touch on this because they are relevant for triple negative breast cancer, only work in inherited kinds of cancers. So the inherited breast cancer susceptibility genes, and there's nothing you can blame on your mother or your father, another sort of, I think, to me, odd, odd misconception is people think you inherit only from your mother, but in fact, you can inherit these genes from your father the same way. It's Mendelian, you know, genetics, it's, you know, fruit flies and things, right? So you can get this gene either from your mother or your father. Now, of course, on your father's side, typically they don't get breast cancer, but they can pass it on. And about five to 10% of breast cancers are from inherited mutations, mostly in BRCA1 or BRCA2. BRCA1 is about twice as common uh, as BRCA2, and then BRCA1 and 2 together are much more common than the next most common one, which is called PALB2. Now within BRCA1, the most common one, about half of those are triple negative. And so that's why I'm commenting on this in a triple negative talk. And in truth, a patient who comes into my clinic who has triple negative breast cancer, our threshold is in fact much lower for doing inherited breast cancer susceptibility testing simply because having triple negative breast cancer itself raises the likelihood of having an inherited kind. You know, and the reason this is important is, you know, knowledge is power, right? And so, you know, some of you may have heard of the Angelina effect, Angelina Jolie. In fact, her family um, has a, her mother died of ovarian cancer, I believe it's ovarian. Um, and she, in fact, her family had, carries one of these inherited susceptibility genes and she had it and she ended up having bilateral mastectomy as well as oophorectomy as a preventive strategy quite a few years ago. And I say sometimes or usually knowledge is power because on the right is Arlo Guthrie um, and, you know, that he unfortunately suffered from uh, Huntington's disease and that's a genetic abnormality that you can detect, but uh, is, there is no uh, 
prophylaxis that can be done. So I think, you know, it's not always powerful, but in this case, actually prophylactic mastectomy and ophorectomy for uh, breast cancer susceptibility genes are actually more than 95% effective in prevention. So what are the implications of knowing about this? Uh, the first is that prophylactic mastectomy works. Uh, there are there are alternatives. There's augmented screening using MRI that that are you know reasonably good. They're better than than traditional screening. Um, prophylactic oophorectomy, meaning removal of the ovaries, also works and is probably even more important because even though ovarian cancer is less common than breast cancer of any kind, triple negative or any of the other ones. Um, we don't have a good screening tool for it. So it's it's one that typically shows up in a, in a later stage. And then drug implications down the road if the cancer becomes recurrent. And I'll talk about that in a minute. I wanna highlight some of the places where we've learned a lot of these things, the Carolina Breast Cancer Study, which some of you may have heard of, which has been running in this state for since 1993 in three different phases. The phases one and two uh, ran until 2001. We're in the east and central part of the state and was focused, both of, actually all phases have been focused on black and premenopausal women as a component. So they were half black, half white, half uh, premenopausal, half postmenopausal, in order to answer questions broadly about all of those groups. And those two phases really started out with the intention of saying, why do women get breast cancer? But they gave, gave us a lot more information as they went along. Phase three was a, was a large study of 3,000 women, only breast cancer patients uh, from 44, so expanded into the western part of the state, and, and actually collected information about treatment and and prospectively, meaning in a planned way, asked a lot of questions about um, uh, what were the patients treated with, what were they able to take, what were they not able to take, how did they do uh, in a much more detailed way. So this was uh, actually one of the first studies that looked at whether patients get different kind, different kinds of patients get different kinds of breast cancer. And I'm summarizing it here, it said basically that younger women and black women are much more likely about, particularly if you're a black young woman, you're about twice as likely to get triple negative breast cancer as an older white woman. <clears throat> And it, when we were able to start to use molecular tools to study this uh, in a subsequent in Carolina breast cancer phase three, it actually is even more stark that the more negative biologic subtypes of breast cancer, that particularly those that comprise triple negative compared to the uh, more benign, not that breast cancer is ever benign, but, but the more good prognosis ones actually were even more starkly affecting particularly black women as well as young women. Um, now, I wanna be very clear, because this is another misconception that comes up. Any kind of patient can get any kind of breast cancer. You know, you can be, you know, 90 years old and, and white and you can still get triple negative breast cancer. It's just a, a relative thing. Um, and so it's, it's all proportions. So now we actually, when we first found this differential, and, and many of you may know that one of the, the, the real problems that face us is breast cancer, and as well as many other cancers, has a, a disparity in outcome by race. And, and women of color who get breast cancer, state for sage, do much worse than a similar group of women who aren't of color, white women. And what we thought was, well, maybe this differential with a lot more triple negative in the black women compared to the white women who had more luminal cancers, maybe that's why uh, they're doing worse. And what we actually found is if you look at the uh, triple negative breast cancer subtype, you know, the poor prognosis types, um, and in particular the triple negative, uh, it actually didn't matter what race you were, both whites and blacks with triple negative had equally relatively poorer survival, um, uh, and it didn't matter a lot. On the left-hand side, you see where we found that most of the racial disparity within a subtype was actually in the what we would consider to be the best prognosis subtype, ER positive, HER2 negative, um, where whites were uh, substantially almost twice, ha had almost twice the uh, uh, survival as, as blacks in terms of uh, relapse rates, et cetera. Um, I think there's, a, for our, our social scientists, we're not surprised at this because, uh, you know, when advances are made, and there have been a lot of advances in ER positive, her two negative, and you can see patients are doing better. I don't know. Could you see if I move my little thing? Can you guys see this? My little cursor thing. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. So you probably haven't looked at these, but these are called Kaplan-Meier curves. And this little dot, 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 dot down here is basically, this is survival. This is everybody's alive. And then this is it going down. To, these are the years after diagnosis. And you can see by about 10 years out, out you know, about 15% of people um, uh, uh, have died, right, If from the white population. And, and it's more like, you know, 20, 25 percent in the black population. So that's that's what's called a Kaplan-Meier curve. And this is if you look at the same thing in in triple negative, everybody's doing much you know more poorly. And so part of this also let us look at risk. And this was in the original Carolina breast cancer study, which had uh, women with breast cancer and women without breast cancer. It's called a case control study. Um, and what they found, interestingly, uh, I say they, I mean, I was, I was part of this, this study, I came in during the time that this was running and joined UNC, um, that, that it mattered some of these traditional risk factors that, that, you know, I learned about in my training and everybody talks about. Um, actually, so for example, it's always been this, this idea that, that, you know, having lots of children and having your children when you're very young is is protective, right? That was the sort of dogma. And in truth it is, but it's only protective in ER positive breast cancer. In fact, it wasn't protective in tri for triple negative breast cancer. Now, some things are, you know, it was a relative thing. So these are interesting because they actually went in opposite directions between uh, triple negative and estrogen receptor positive cancers. Other things like breastfeeding just had a bigger effect. So this was a one good thing that came out was breastfeeding seems to be particularly protective for triple negative breast cancer. And obesity is not good for either in terms of breast cancer uh, risk. So, I mean, these are opportunities. If you can understand who might get a certain kind of breast cancer, that helps you tailor preventive strategies, uh, at least theoretically. Although it is hard for the reason I said before, which is anybody can get any kind of cancer. You, you can do this on a relative basis, but not an absolute one. But in truth, you know, prevention strategies may t be tailorable in groups that are more prone, like, you know, black women, for example. So I want to talk about treatment. You know, I'm a medical oncologist, which means that I spend most of my time, you know, much of what I uh, just showed you was work that I participated in. But the people who are running these are epidemiologists and God love them because they are, you know, they're, they do, you know, the huge heavy lifting about how we understand what's happening in the community and how we disseminate things, you know, but I'm a I'm a, I'm a physician and I treat breast cancer patients. And in fact, uh, you already have to have breast cancer to get into my clinic. So I want to talk about that. So I'm highlighting again some of the differences between, and I was I was making the point about early breast cancer that's at stages one, two, and three versus stage stage four at diagnosis or metastatic evolution to metastatic. And the reason is that the goals of therapy are different between metastatic cancer and early breast cancer. And and if you if you look on the bottom what we consider to be the way we give our medical therapy, which is neoadjuvant, and I'll tell you what neoadjuvant means, but either neoadjuvant or adjuvant, which means around the time of surgery, the purpose of those uh, uh, medical therapies is in fact to help cure the patient and, and to put them through a certain amount of time of therapy and then be able to stop and have the cancer never overtly recur after that. The goal of therapy is different in metastatic disease because, and this is not important, but there is a, some uh, basically mathematical as well as biological reasons. And for, for a, a variety of these, at the moment, we don't think of, of cure as being a realistic goal for metastatic disease. Instead, it's the aim is trying to turn it into a well-tolerated chronic disease. And what that's called is palliation. The word palliation, some people think means giving up. It's not, it just means control and a focus on quality of life in addition to treatment. So let's talk about the advances in early or non-metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And they're really the main things that have happened over the last couple of decades are chemotherapy, which is the mainstay of treatment. So if you think about it in the very beginning, I said, well, triple negative is defined by what it isn't, right? It doesn't have targetable abnormalities, at least targetable using the tools that we have in the toolbox right now. That means we're reliant on chemotherapy from a medical standpoint. Now, chemotherapy has gotten better. And so that's actually, you know, there's some success stories there. I mean, we'd all like to not use chemotherapy, but uh, but having it be better chemotherapy is, is a good thing. 
Um, the other thing I'll talk about is the timing of chemotherapy. And we've had some real advances and we help patients more through the preoperative timing of giving that chemotherapy, which is now really the standard. So neoadjuvant therapy, and that term neoadjuvant, it's kind of a bad term because it's not very informative if you don't know what it means, uh, but what it really is is preoperative. Um, and, and what I show you here is a very simple study. This was a, a study called NSABP B18. That's not important, but it was like the 18th of this one group's studies. And they took almost 1,500 patients and they asked a really simple question. If you gave exactly the same chemotherapy and you didn't try and tailor anything or do anything fancy, you just said, we're just going to take half the women and they're going to have surgery and then they're going to get their chemo. And the other half are going to get their chemo and then they're going to go to surgery. Does it matter? Does it matter from the standpoint of relapse? Does it matter from the standpoint of survival? Does it, does it, does it matter? What you can't see um, on the right, so DFS is disease-free survival. That's not an important phrase. Dis DDFS is distant disease-free survival, and OS is overall survival. These are all just standard clinical trials metrics looking at relapse and, and outcome. And you remember those Kaplan-Meier curves I showed you before where the curves separate if there's a difference? Well, this is two curves that are totally superimposed on each other. You can't even tell any, there's, there's, I mean, you couldn't, if you drew it, you couldn't make them more aligned with each other. And the basic, you know, take home was it makes exactly zero difference from the standpoint of distant relapse and survival, whether the chemo goes first or the surgery goes first. And that may seem sort of obvious, but the truth is they didn't know. They didn't know if delaying surgery, for example, would do some harm or whether like backing up the chemo would do a lot of good. So why do we care about that? If it doesn't matter, then, then you say, oh, it's a wash. Well, actually, no, because what does happen is when you give the chemotherapy or anti-HER2 therapy or other you know, medical therapy, um, but particularly triple negative chemotherapy, you actually help the surgeon do less surgery. You know, our surgeons have been working pretty hard to try and put themselves out of business. And I think, you know, we're, we're complicit in helping them do that. Um, so this is a trial that, that I participate, help participate in. 40603 is just the name of the trial. In this trial, it was all triple negative breast cancer patients. Um, it had to have a certain size tumor. They had to be, have reasonably high risk cancer and it had to be brand new. They had to have no, no previous treatment for the cancer, no surgery, no chemo, no nothing. At the time that they presented in the trial, about half of them, the cancer was too big uh, to do a lumpectomy. And we deliberately asked the surgeons up front, if you wanted to, if you were to go to surgery tomorrow, could you do a lumpectomy? In your, in your expert opinion, could you do a lumpectomy? And they said, for half of the patients, they said, no, cancer's too big. We then, on, in the context of the trial, which the trial had a bunch of different arms to it, but if you lump all of them together and say, in the, in the context of the trial, give chemotherapy. And then we asked the surgeons again and said, okay, how about now? Could you do a lumpectomy now? And of that group that they said it was too big, you can't do a lumpectomy, you have to do a mastectomy, 42% of them became candidates for lumpectomy because the cancer shrunk, right? Because of the chemotherapy, the cancer shrunk. And if they did try, now some patients ended up having a mastectomy anyway, but if they tried to, and most of the time they tried, um, more than 90%, it was successful, meaning they were able to just cut around it and get clean margins, meaning there's no cancer around the outside. And they were successful in converting patients who, who, could have, who couldn't have a lumpectomy and wanted one into patients who had a successful lumpectomy. That's a real benefit for patients. I think an even more compelling surgical story about this is reducing the need for axillary dissection. So axillary dissection is when you surgically remove all the lymph nodes in the armpit. So the draining lymph nodes from that breast. Um, the problem with axillary dissection is it can, can cause lymphedema. It's up to 20% of patients who have the armpit lymph nodes removed can get lymphedema. And you can see a picture of particularly uh, uh, dramatic lymphedema, but you know you can have that at varying degrees and it, and it is uncomfortable for patients. They have to wear sleeves, et cetera, et cetera. Now in the trial of that, in that CLGB40603 trial, there were 153 of the 400 or so patients who had known involved lymph nodes. So before they started, the lymph nodes were involved and, and you know before they started chemotherapy. 
in 67% of those, the nodes were cleared, meaning the cancer was gone. When they took out the lymph nodes using a sentinel node procedure, there weren't, wasn't any cancer in them, and they did not have to have axillary dissection. That's a huge benefit for patients. It means much smaller surgery and not eliminating, but the risk goes down to maybe 2 or 3% uh, if you avoid that axillary dissection. So I think that's also a huge benefit for patients. And this is the reason that now this neoadjuvant chemotherapy or preoperative chemotherapy is now the standard of care for all but really small you know, overtly node negative, uh, uh, triple negative breast cancer patients. Now let's get to the medical therapy. Um, I've spent enough time touting for my, <clears throat> my surgical colleagues. So the truth is that, you know, although we haven't had a breakthrough in terms of triple negative breast cancer and targeted therapy, the drugs that we have have gotten better and they, in fact, are helping patients. More of them are, are cured using the, the, you know, the way we, we term that uh, between now and a few years ago. So what you see here, this is a Canadian. The Canadians track this stuff very carefully. They have a registry in British Columbia that's been doing this for years. And you can see, so this is, here's diagnosis is point, point zero. And every one of these numbers is basically the years since diagnosis. So, and this is the relapse, okay? So this is relapse and the rate of relapse. So you can see each of these. So this is ER negative HER2 positive from 1986 to 1992. ER negative, so it's almost a 25% risk of relapse in the first year after diagnosis during this time frame. if you had that kind of breast cancer. This is triple negative in red. Here's another HER2 positive, and then this is ER positive, HER2 negative. Um, so here's triple negative. So in the second year, the third year, so it's the particularly highest risk is early on in triple negative breast cancer, and then it falls off. That's actually a common uh, thing that's been seen in every, every, uh, uh, every registry that we've looked at. So now 2004 to 2008, still the same uh, uh, British Ke uh, Columbia registry. Now it's now only 10% or so in that first year. And now it's only about seven or 8% in the second year. So you can see real blunting in the, in the um, uh, outcomes of these patients simply through better chemotherapy. So what I'd say is that's, what are the advances? The advances are polychemotherapy. So we now know and have several drugs that work. We can give them more quickly. We can give them more effectively. We can give them more safely. Um, we have growth factors that allow us to speed them up, which makes them uh, more, more effective at uh, eliminating the, the cancer recurrence. We have some newer drugs that may not help uh, prevent relapse, but actually can help improve the shrinkage of the tumor and the elimination of the lymph nodes, and that can help with surgical endpoints. And I'd say overall, uh, chemotherapy is a lot more tolerable than it was when I was um, uh, in my training. We have much more effective anti-nausea prevention. We have better treatment for neuropathy. We have some prevention for neuropathy, and we have preventive strategies for hair loss. Um, and I would say this is, you know, this is all good, right? You know, nobody's going to quibble that that patients are doing better. But I would argue we have a long ways to go. And this, and I consider triple negative to remain one of our biggest unmet needs. Now, what about metastatic triple negative breast cancer, and and how are we doing in triple negative breast cancer? You know, I think right now. I think we're doing better. And I'll show you some data and say right now, like within the last year or two, um, we're starting to see some improvements in survival after the diagnosis of metastatic triple negative breast cancer, but it's taken until really recently. And during that same time frame, there were imp improving the cure rate for early triple negative breast cancer. During that time frame, we were not seeing a lot of improvement in metastatic outcomes. And you can see it's about, we looked in our own database, we have a couple thousand patients that we've been tracking. And between 2000 you know, and 2019, we didn't see much of a change in survival. Other databases, you know, our friends at Dana-Farber, similarly have not seen the needle budging. Now we have seen it in the other kinds of breast cancer, just not triple negative. But again, I do think there's some advances I'll talk about in the last couple of years that are changing that. There are new drugs on the scene. And remember, one of the reasons that this is important is that advances in metastatic disease can move into the early setting and then can help, help there so even more. So, uh, you know, we want to keep 
keep moving the needle, but we oftentimes start with metastatic disease. I mentioned the genetics and, uh, you know, there are opportunities and I'm, I'm pointing this out deliberately. So we have some even potentially targetable abnormalities in triple negative breast cancer. I mentioned that it's defined by what it isn't, but it is not itself a biologically monolithic thing. If you take a bunch of triple negative breast cancers and you do, you know, biologic subtyping just in triple negative breast cancer, and this has been done a variety of different ways. Uh, you know, our own Chuck Peru kind of invented one of the ways that we use subtype cancers in general. Uh, this is from our friends at MD Anderson. And, and it's not important what these names are, but basically there's always a group that turn out to be androgen receptor positive. It's a subset of triple negative breast cancers. That's a potential targetable abnormality. There's signal, what are called cellular signaling pathways, meaning some ways that the cancer grows, that there are some abnormalities that are cropping up that might be able to be uh, uh, treated with drugs that go after those particular signals. And there's immune activation. I'm going to talk about that. And, and I think the point is that triple negative breast cancer is in fact a heterogeneous entity. We're just now getting a handle on the ways in which that might be targetable. Um, but it's also from the tumor and also what I'm calling the microenvironment, because remember the immune system, which I'll talk about later, is not part of the tumor. It's the, it's the, re it's the host. It's the, it's the rest of the body reacting to the tumor. So I'm highlighting a little bit of the like recent things. So <laughs> um, all these drugs over here on the left are a bunch of chemotherapy drugs and the date that they got uh, uh, approved. And you can see, you know, we're starting back cyclophosphamide, you know, which was, you know, long before I was born <laughs> with cyclophosphamide, apparently, and I still use it. So that's a, that's a drug that is, that has been around for a long, long time. Uh, doxorubicin, you know, cisplatin, carboplatin, taxanes, you know, up until the 90s. But look at the pile that's up on the, on the far right-hand side. So just in the last couple of years, we've had five drugs approved uh, that are relevant for triple negative breast cancer, either in or enriched for triple negative breast cancer. I'm going to talk about them. So I'm going to tell there's three t bins I'm going to talk about. First is welcome ADCs to the triple negative breast cancer. ADCs I'm going to call smart chemo. Newer tumor targeted agents, um, and then targeting the tumor microenvironment, which is immune. Mostly at the moment, that's mostly immune cells. Although there are other targets that that you know aren't really relevant yet, but are you know we have some hope. So let's start with ADCs. So ADCs are antibody drug conjugates and I'm calling them antibodies with benefits. So the one that's relevant right now is a drug called sasituzumab govotecan or Tridelvi for those of you who are looking at, at, at a, you know, direct to, mark, direct to consumer marketing, that's what its trade name is. And all of these antibody drug conjugates have the same basic construct. They take an antibody against a cancer protein. So the first ADC in breast cancer was actually an ADC in HER2 positive breast cancer, and it took Herceptin or Trastuzumab, which is the standard anti-HER2 drug, and it attached a chemotherapy to it. That's how they work. So this one is an antibody against a common cancer protein that's found in 80% of triple negative breast cancers called TROPE2. Now, trope 2 itself isn't something that you attack, it's something you grab onto. And because it's preferentially uh, seen in triple negative breast cancer and not normal cells of the body, then you can use it as something to attack. Then they have a linker and what they attach to the antibody is a chemotherapy drug. But the chemotherapy drug is, it's like a Trojan horse. The chemotherapy drug is attached to the antibody. It gets delivered by the antibody to whatever cell has the protein, the trope two, which is gonna be mostly cancer cells. In that way, you can actually use a version of the chemotherapy that's more potent. You can't give it by vein because if it floats around all through the body, it's too toxic. But if you're delivering it preferentially to the cancer cells, then you can use a chemotherapy that, that is particularly potent and effective. So sasituzumab, this is a, the seminal trial of sasituzumab against regular chemotherapy given by vein. Now, sasituzumab is given by vein too, but it's not what I call free chemotherapy. It's attached to that antibody. Now, this is a group of patients who had, on average, received four previous treatments, mostly chemotherapy. So they have pretty resistant disease. 
Um, and you can see this is the survival. This is overall survival. So from the time of when they started treatment on the trial and the chemo was basically left up to the treating physician, they had a menu and they could pick whatever chemo they and the patient felt would be best for that patient versus being randomized to receive sasituzumab. And it's not too hard to see that the sasituzumab was outperforming chemotherapy in this setting. And, and it basically doubled the average survival from six months to 12 months. So there, now it's, you know, all of these dr drugs have some side effects. In this case, sasituzumab ha can affect your blood counts like any drug that has a chemotherapy attached to it and diarrhea. Um, but, you know, so does chemotherapy and it's quite a nice addition to our armamentarium. Now, what I don't know is how it would perform compared to earlier chemotherapy. Um, we'll have to see. And if you don't mind muting, uh, yeah. that would be great. None of that. You know exactly what you Leslie? Okay, thank you. Um, now, antibody drug conjugates, there's a lot of these in development. I mean, because now there's two in breast cancer. One in, well, actually, there's three in breast cancer. Um, two in HER2 positive breast cancer and one in triple negative breast cancer. So we already have some successes. We also have, they're hard to do. These are like feats of, of biomedical engineering. Some have already failed, but it's a validated approach that's now been shown to work in triple negative breast cancer. So I can tell, promise you there will be more of these. Now, what about new tumor targeted agents? Um, so I want to talk about PARP inhibition, and, and, and I mentioned earlier that I was going to talk a little bit about drugs that only work in inherited breast cancer, and these are particularly the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations that are inherited. Um, it actually looks like sometimes the cancer evolves to have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation, and it works in them too, but most of them are inherited. So why would this matter? BRCA1 and BRCA2, what, among their jobs, and they have several jobs, but one of their jobs is that they fix DNA damage. As you walk around, your, your, the DNA in your cells is always getting broken and getting repaired. You know, if you breathe, you get oxidative damage. You get, you know, you're, it's just normal turnover. And, and your cells all have machinery that fixes DNA damage. And, and that's a normal part of living and growing. Now, BRCA1 and 2, both, part of their jobs is to help fix DNA damage. If you inherit a, a mutation in BRCA1 or 2, so you inherit an abnormal one from your mom or your dad, in your cancer, the normal one virtually always gets lost. Like that's one of the hallmarks of cancers in BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers is that they lost the, the normal ones also gone. So they have really no functional BRCA1 or 2. One or two. In that setting, PARP takes over. So PARP is an enzyme. It's actually a family of enzymes. And, and the cell switches its mechanism of fixing DNA damage to a mechanism that requires PARP. Now, so what you're thinking, if you think about it, so in the cancer cells, uniquely in the cancer cells, you have BRCA1 or 2 was inherited and lost. And that's true in all the cells of the body. But in addition, in the cancer, they've lost the second one. And if you throw in a PARP inhibitor, so it's now lost its you know, plan B, then the cancer cell can get killed. And that's what PARP inhibitors do. So this is, these are two studies that I'm showing you from, of PARP inhibitors in inherited metastatic breast cancer. Um, and one is called Olympiad. That's just the name of the trial. And it tested a drug called Olaparib. So Olaparib was tested against chemotherapy. Um, and, and what you see here is the difference uh, be before between standard chemotherapy and olaparib in the time before progression, meaning the be time before the cancer started growing again and the patient had to go on to a new therapy. So this is olaparib. And here's a very similar design, very similar trial with a sim similar kind of drug, also a PARP inhibitor called talazoparib. Um, and, you know, 42%, 46%, those are basically the same improvement in time before progression compared with the chemotherapy that was allowed in those trials. Now, these drugs only work, as far as we know, in inherited cancer in which triple negative is overrepresented, which is why I'm talking about it. And I say that with a little bit of, you know, it's not an absolute thing. I just mentioned to you that in some, a few cancers that develop BRCA mutations, it also looks like it works in them. But for the most part, these only work in inherited cancer. 
both these drugs are better and more tolerable than chemotherapy that's used later in the disease course. I don't know if they're better than the kind of chemotherapy we use early, but you know, these are, these are oral and they're pretty tolerable. So I think, uh, you know, if I know somebody has a germline mutation, I'm certainly reaching for them in metastatic disease. Neither of them improved overall survival in these studies. And, and I think there's some future directions for this, which is, you know, number one, can you create a BRCA-like situation in triple negative breast cancer so that these drugs start to work, even if BRCA1 and 2 you don't have an inherited mutation. And there's some ways of trying to do that, that other drug combinations may help shift the cancer cell towards that same behavior, that same mechanism of repairing DNA damage, which might let these PARP inhibitors work in a broader array of tumors. Um, and so I think uh, that that's one of the big future directions. Now, what about new cellular pathways, new, new tumor targets? I'm using this as an example because this is one of the drug, the classes of drugs that are, were looking, you know, exciting in triple negative breast cancer. There were two trials that looked very similar. This is called AKT inhibitor. So AKT is part of a pathway of a mechanism by which the cell grows. And it turns out if you can disrupt it, uh, in this setting, it might help uh, treat the cancer better. So this is uh, this is the pathway. It has a bunch of proteins and, and genes in it. So these are all the parts of that uh, pathway. And if any of them were messed up, this this you know meaning that the the cell looked like it was somehow uh, sensitive to this, and this was a mechanism that it was using to be to be driven. If you then gave it an inhibitor of the pathway, this Capivacertib added to chemotherapy. You know, these are the ones with who got the capivacertib. These are the ones who didn't, and it looks like it's better. This is a small study. Now, as a proof of principle, you know, just to test the hypothesis that this drug wouldn't work in everybody, the ones who the pathway didn't look like it was altered, didn't look like the cell was depending on that to uh, to grow, the drug capivacertib didn't look like it worked. Now, I say this is a work in progress because this was a phase two study. Now, when they did a more definitive, larger trial with more patients, it didn't look like it worked as well. In fact, it wasn't statistically significant. There's some other trials that are a little bit different that are that haven't come out yet, but I certainly wouldn't say that this is a known home run. It's a, it's, but this is the kind of thing that we may end up with uh, in the future. I mentioned the androgen receptor. So there's a subset of triple negative cancers, triple negative breast cancers that are what are called luminal AR. Um, and, you know, they are negative for estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, but the androgen receptor is another part of the endocrine mechanisms and endocrine cascade. In fact, it is the main receptor uh, uh, that drives testosterone, you know, the impact of testosterone. And in fact, anti-androgen uh, drugs we use in prostate cancer, you know, because that is in fact a mechanism. That's the, the, the analog to anti-estrogen therapies that we use in breast cancer are the anti-androgen drugs we use in prostate cancer. And there's a subset of triple negative breast cancers that look like they may have that pathway is driving them and they may be sensitive to those kind of drugs. All we have right now are small studies and what they did show us was that they could, you know, the patients with this kind of triple negative breast cancer, given these prostate drugs, and I show you here on the bottom a table that has the different drugs. These are all drugs that are used in prostate cancer. Um, they seem to grow more slowly than expected for triple negative breast cancer. And you can see in all of them, it was about 20 or 30% of the patients, the cancer stopped growing for at least six months. Now, the problem that we have is that we don't know if this is a pokier kind of triple negative breast cancer all by itself, right? It's possible that it's just a slower growing thing and that the drugs weren't doing that much. But this is the kind of thing, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that in fact, the drugs were contributing to this and they might be part of, of the armamentarium in the future. There are some trials that are looking at this, but we're, we're not sure yet. 
And then last, I'm going to talk about immunotherapy because I think that's been among the more exciting things that we've uh, uh, had come into our, our uh, clinics over the last couple of years. And that's targeting the tumor microenvironment. Again, the immune cells are not the cancer. They are the microenvironment interacting with the cancer and, and we're hoping uh, increasingly effectively. So what is the importance of the immune system here? And this is true of triple negative or any other cancer, right? We use, we use immunotherapies in lots of cancers. Number one, it's already there. At, you know, so immune system's there. It is there designed to attack foreign invaders, right? It's designed to fight off infections. But in truth, cancer is not normal you, right? It's aberrant. And so, you know, what we want is for the immune system to consider the cancer as a foreign invader. The immune system is also useful because it actually has systems to turn it on and off and, and the cells are stable. So one of the problems with triple negative breast cancer is all cancers are what are called mutable. They just are, are, you know, they have genetic aberrations. Triple negative in particular has a tendency to form more mutations over time particularly under the selective pressure of these drugs, right? The, the tumors come up with mutations to get around and become resistant to the drugs that we give. But the immune system cells, right? We're not targeting the immune cells. They don't, they're stable. They don't mutate. And so they, if we can get them to work, it should continue to work. Now, the however, you know, cancer isn't really foreign. There's a lot of the cancer that looks a lot like the person who developed the cancer from the standpoint of the biology. The immune system is crazy complex and and which is why this has been going on for a long time and sometimes getting the immune system jazzed up can can do harm and that's what autoimmune diseases are so i'm i'm showing this this is like the newsweek cover of steve rosenberg who was a famous scientist at the uh, nih who was you know the first breakthrough in immunotherapy was touted in 1985. Um, it took us a little while uh, before we finally got cancer immunotherapy to work and to be the breakthrough of the, of the year, uh, literally 30 years later. Now, what about breast cancer? So we were a little bit late to the party um, for a variety of reasons, um, which is partly because cancer, breast cancer tends to be a little bit colder and a little bit less immunologically tractable than some other cancers. But you can see here that we do have uh, a, a form of, of immunotherapy. And you can see on the left, there's a lot of ways of getting uh, uh, immunotherapy to work. Um, lots of targets, lots of types, vaccinations, things that, uh, uh, that mimic the T cell and get them jazzed up, you know, adoptive transfer, there are thing called CAR T, but then there's these things called checkpoint inhibitors, which are basically target these proteins called PD-1 and PDL one And that's where we have two drugs that are improved in triple negative breast cancer targeting that. So how does it work? The, the short answer is that cancer hides from the immune system using an invisibility cloak and these, these drugs pull away the invisibility cloak. The longer answer, so, so this is the, the walking through. So T cells, right, which are part of your immune system, they're designed to recognize and kill infections or tumor cells, right, we would hope. And they, and they do do that, right? Otherwise we would have, we'd all get cancer by the time we were three months old, right? We do have mutations and, and aberrant cells that probably form all the time and your immune system wipes them out and you never know about it. It's when it escapes from that, that the tumor grows. But T cells, in fact, are designed to recognize and kill uh, uh, tumor cells. And I'm, I'm using, this is a series of slides that I borrowed from my dear friend, Ian Krop. Uh, uh, so, so I'm giving him full credit. And so if it works, they can kill off the tumor cell. PD-1 is an off switch. I told you the immune system has on and off switches. That's normal, right? You don't want your immune system always on, right? Otherwise it would just, it would wipe out all the rest of you. Um, PD-1 is a switch. PDL one is on the tumor cell and these, this is the ways in which they can interact with each other. And by P when PDL one on a tumor cell is present, it actually functionally turns the switch off and turns the T cell off. If you can inactivate that interaction, PD, either through you know 
preventing the, the interaction on the PD-1 side or the PD-L1 side, you can keep the tumor cells from inactivating the T cells that would normally recognize them and start the immune system to, to attack. So this is where we are now. Um, and we have, I'm going to show you a couple, an example, but this has been now done with two different drugs. Uh, at, in metastatic untreated triple negative breast cancer. So the patients could have had treatment when they were first diagnosed, but after becoming metastatic, they could not. This was the first thing they received was chemotherapy and an anti pdl one antibody or a placebo. So this is in fact what you see in pdl one positive triple negative breast cancer. And, and you can see the average survival with the chemotherapy plus the anti pdl one drug, which is called atezolizumab in this particular case, uh, uh, you know, was now 25 months, which is about twice uh, uh, what was expected. Um, and more than half of them were still alive two years later. And so this is, you know, this is, this was a real advance. Now, it is also true that there is a variety of tumors and some are more what we call cold and some are more hot. And in truth, those that are pdl one positive and in this particular uh, patient setting, it, it was about 40% of them. It's about 30 to 40% of triple negative breast cancers are pdl one positive. Um, and those are the ones that tend to respond. The ones that are lower tend not to respond. And one of the challenges we have is turning a cold tumor hot. And there's a whole lot of uh, uh, research going on right now trying to figure out how to do that. So here's some of the ways, right, that people are doing. So you can add chemotherapy. That's the way that it was done in this particular study. You can add anti-tumor antibodies or other targeted therapies, even hormonal therapies might be able to do this. And so you'll see some combination uh, trials that will be coming out uh, in trying to that are designed exactly to do this. So let me start to, to summarize. I think curing metastatic breast cancer is in fact not a, it's not a, there's no one thing that's going to do this. Um, you know, there's a bunch of things. So what's shown here is kind of all of what we call the hallmarks of cancer, each of which has potential strategies for, for, for inhibiting and breaking it up. My, I think in triple negative breast cancer, it's, none of these things would probably work by themselves, but taken together, I think there's a lot of ways in which uh, uh, strategies that go around the whole circle may be successful. So I also want to leave you with uh, a thought for the future, which is I don't think we're going to be calling anything triple negative a few years from now. I think it's not a particularly helpful term, and I think we are already starting to evolve towards recognizing that there are entities within triple negative that we should recognize as biologically distinct and hopefully soon therapeutically distinct. And, and what's shown here is sort of a variety of them uh, that, that may be the ways in which we start to bin these. So we may in the future have, instead of triple negative, we'll have, you know, BRCA like uh, or, uh, you know, AR positive or, you know, AKT positive. Um, and, and that's where I hope we are in the, in the not to do. And I have caught, I have uh, cautious optimism that that will be true. Thank you very much. That was great. That was a wonderful overview and all the advancements for triple negative. Thank you so much. Sure. Happy to. Really wonderful. And your slides were terrific. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> So I think everybody was mesmerized and I don't have a lot of questions. So let me tell you what I do have. Um, and again, I apologize for my little background noise on my computer. Um, the first question, how long should a stage one triple negative breast cancer person keep a port in after treatment? You know, I generally take ports out as soon as I'm not using them. You know, they're That's just there. They can just get infected. They can get clotted. And if I'm not using it, take it out. That's great. I'm sure that I'm sure that pleases her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, if gene testing is inconclusive, and also if the probability of a recurrence is inconclusive, what am I supposed to do with that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, this patient goes into a little bit of her history, which is would be too specific. 
Um, so I was trying to generalize it. It's, it's okay. Um, you can you can be specific with it. Well, we we want to ask general questions. Um, so if if the if gene testing, oh, I think is this is about germline testing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the germline testing. You know, I think the question generally is how good is germline testing in identifying well, it's, it's, BRCA? It's, it's, not, it's not about the ger germline testing. It, it's about having triple net negative in 2008 and having a second new recurrence in 2018 and my genetics being inconclusive. So what's the probability or... Um, recurrence. So I can't speak to that. I don't because I don't know the, the details. I can say in general, um, germline testing, you know, is, is only positive in five to 10 percent, which isn't to say that people can't get a first triple negative breast cancer and a second triple negative breast cancer, um, even in, in, in ones with these expanded panels. It may not be uh, you know, related to a genetic abnormality. Um, and so triple negative breast cancer, most triple negative breast cancers, even in pa patients who've had more than one of them, uh, is not, are not, uh, there's no attached BRCA1 or 2 uh, mutation. Looks Thank like you. The, sure. Looks like the next one is about research on lobular triple negatives. Well, lobulars, pleomorphic lobulars can be triple negative. Some lobulars can be triple negative. There's research on lobulars. Most of them are hormone receptor positive. Uh, they are also less common than ductals or what are called mixed, um, duct, mixed ductal and lobulars. Um, so yes, there's some research, but there isn't a lot. And it doesn't, at the moment, they're certainly not treated any differently than than uh, uh, other triple negatives. Um, I do think that when a lobular looks triple negative, we certainly look pretty carefully at our pathology and make sure that the that the staining was done well. Um, uh, and But, but it, this does happen sometimes. Uh, neuropathy. Um, so neuropathy, you know, there's there's now things where people wear, you know, the cold, the the gloves and the the booties um, to help prevent it. Um, there are some some medications that can be helped. There's some old ones like uh, you know gabapentin and things like that uh, uh, that can that can be helpful. Um, uh, and then some newer ones. So I think neuropathy, although to be honest the best thing for neuropathy is to help prevent it from happening in the first place. So I have to say when I have a patient who's developing neuropathy, um, even a little bit of it, we tend to adjust the doses to try and keep it from getting worse because it's, because it's mostly reversible um, unless you let it get, get, get bad. Uh, can I speak to Zolota? Um, yeah. And I didn't talk about, uh, and I, and I should have actually, so thank you for, for bringing that up, Donna. Um, one of the advances that's happened recently is, well, you know, four or five years ago, um, was in this neoadjuvant paradigm where we now are moving the chemotherapy to before surgery. That's also given us some information that we didn't used to have, which is if the cancer is, has been eradicated at the time of surgery, then those patients tend to do fairly well. And they do better than those who still have what we call residual disease or cancer left um, uh, after, after the chemotherapy is done. There's still cancer left either in the breast or in the lymph nodes. There was a study called CREATE-X, which, which took those patients and gave half of them uh, a drug called Zolota, or the real name of it is capecitabine, um, for six months. And the other half did not get capecitabine. And the patients who got capecitabine did better. So more of them were, were cured. Um, when they looked at the subsets, it was not a triple negative trial, but it looked like most of the benefit of the capecitabine was actually in the triple negative subset of the trial. And so it's actually become quite common now if patients have uh, residual disease after their more conventional chemotherapy, we give them six months of capecitabine afterward. Um, I think the newer things that may be coming, you know, in addition to that, and there are some studies looking at other drugs in that arena. Um, and so, you know, I think we may be able to even do better than capecitabine alone with the residual disease patients. 
Um, that's a place where immunotherapy is being looked at. That's a place where drugs like that, sasetuzumab, govotecan are, are likely to be looked at. So there'll be others, but you're right. I'm, I'm, I actually should have put a slide in about that. And thank you for bringing it up. Uh, are all of the new drugs still chemotherapy? Are any of these available? Uh, all of, so the breakthroughs, everything I've talked about for the most part, the, the things that I put on that timeline are FDA approved drugs that are available every place. Um, uh, they are the antibody drug conjugates, as I mentioned, are chemotherapy, you know, attached to an antibody. That's that sasetuzumab. The other drugs I mentioned, the immunotherapy drugs. So pembrolizumab or Keytruda, um, atezolizumab uh, are immunotherapies and they are added to chemo. And I think you are highlighting the the really important point, which is we are still dependent on chemotherapy, except for the PARP inhibitors for inherited cancer. We are still dependent on chemotherapy to be part of this armamentarium. And I think the idea of getting away from a chemotherapy altogether is something we we would like to have. And but right now everything has some flavor of chemotherapy, uh, uh, you know, in it. Uh, uh, let's see. And capecitabine at the moment is the only thing that we know works in that setting. There are trials looking at other things. Um, and I think I pointed out early that one slide where I showed sort of the peak relapses in the first few years. I think most triple negative breast cancers, not all, right, but most do so within the first I'd say seven or eight years, most in the first five, but there's still that tail down to about into seven or eight. Then it becomes far more unusual, um, you know, such that when you have a patient who's, you know, 10 years, 12 years out and they relapse, we go back and check to make sure the first one was triple negative, right? And, and it can happen, but it starts to become pretty unusual. Uh vaccines, sorry, I'm, I'm picking through, uh, uh, vaccines, patients with breast cancer should get vaccinated. I think we, you know, I mean, this is a rapidly evolving universe, but I'm not aware of any reason not to get vaccinated. And I think that patients with a cancer history are likely to be, you know, early in that next group that will come up if, if a person's not already eligible on the basis of age. Uh, triple negative does respond. Why is it not typed? Uh, like those, the typing, you know, we don't have a clinical way to type it. So, so those are research tools at the moment. Typically things move from the research tool into the clinical arena when there's a, a reason to use them. You know, like when I, the doctor can do something useful with the information because, you know, you have to create a biomarker and then there's this thing called clinical utility. So while those typer tools actually are what we call in my opinion, they are approaching clinical validity, meaning they do segregate the tumors into identifiable bins. But the next question is, does that help anybody? To know that, does it help? And, and at the moment, I don't think it does. And that's called clinical utility. And, and that's when you start seeing it move into the clinic. But I, but I think we're not so far away from that. Um, I don't know the Penn Surmount clinical study, sorry. Uh, mistletoe therapy has not been particularly hopeful, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, Zomata for osteoporosis. Uh, I think all of the, well, so, so the, the use of adjuvant or after surgery um, uh, drugs that combat osteoporosis, there were a series of studies that looked at whether those drugs help prevent recurrence. Um, and the short answer is they might, <laughs> um, uh, but probably mostly in hormone receptor positive breast cancer on, you know, on the other hand, I don't think they, they don't do anything harmful to the, to a tumor. So I think if anybody has osteopenia or anything like, for example, we typically see this in young women that we gave chemo to who we put them into premature menopause, which is one of the problems with chemotherapy is it causes premature menopause. Then they're at risk for um, uh, getting osteoporosis and other you know diseases of early menopause. I have a pretty low threshold for adding these drugs. They did not see, and they have seen that in the 
Zomeda, or that's called a drug called zolandronic acid, that class of drugs of which you know, Fosamax, Baniva, Zomeda, those are all in a certain class of drugs. That's where they see that it's a little bit controversial, um, but that's where they see that in potential impact. They really didn't see it with prolia type drugs um, uh, when they looked at it. On the other hand, I don't think there's a compelling use uh, for an anti-cancer effect. It's a maybe. Um, so I think if prolia is a better drug for you, then that's fine for your bone health. Um, uh, so I have a question about autoimmune disease. If the autoimmune attacks the body, does that mean too healthy immune system or why does the impact, why, how does this complicate breast cancer? Um, you know, the problem, and I think this is evolving. There are some studies of, uh, you know, courageous patients and, and investigators. Traditionally, the patients who already had an autoimmune disease, lupus, things like that, were not eligible to participate in immunotherapy trials because the concern was that the immunotherapy would turn on their autoimmune disease and make their lupus much, much worse and make it attack their kidneys and their heart and their, all this stuff, right? So they typically were not included. Now, whether it can be done safely, I think someone is going to figure that out. At the moment, there's a lot of trepidation about giving immunotherapy to patients who already have an overactive immune system. Uh, tested to subsets. There isn't really, uh, the testing for triple negative and the thing that should be happening for patients, particularly for metastatic patients, is they should be tested for inherited breast cancer. And in my opinion, everybody who has metastatic breast cancer, regardless of their family history, should be tested. And the reason is we have drugs that specifically work in those patients. So even if it's on, even if your family history is not suggestive, I think there's, there's little to be lost, a lot to be potentially gained because you have these other drugs, right? Particularly for triple negative, but I would say that for any metastatic patient. Now, since we don't use PARP inhibitors in early breast cancer, then it's more about prevention strategies and your family members for, for, so it's more driven by the more conventional, uh, um, you know, algorithms. Uh, Oh, uh, so I mentioned the word cure. So, you know, I'm very deliberate. The word cure, and I know, you know, uh, there are scientists say you shouldn't say cure because maybe there are dormant cells and they're, you know, whatever. I don't care. If, if, a, if, if my patient dies at 98 of, you know, you know, a car wreck on her way to the opera and her cancer never came back and we, and they find dormant cancer cells in her liver, she didn't care and I didn't either. <laughs> so I call that cured. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of how I, you know, I, I'm okay. If it stays asleep, that's fine. <laughs> I'd rather it was dead, but if it stays asleep forever, fine. I'll make my peace with that. Um, uh, the five years is at diagnosis. I mean, not that there's any magic about this, but traditionally they start the, they start the clock at, at diagnosis. And I think I'm down at the bottom unless I miss some. I was trying to scroll. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really want to thank you for all the research that you're doing and for sharing everything that you shared with us today, because I just think it gives our survivors hope to know that so many new drugs are being developed and and research is is paving the way to know what is the best treatment for survivors in the future so just thank you for everything that you're doing and for sharing your time and expertise with us today you're very kind thank you so much